السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته أعتقد أن الصوت واضح السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته أهلا بكم في يعني نستطيع أن نقول حصة أخرى من دورات جوجل التي هي طبعا على المباشر في هذه الدورات ستتمكنون بإذن الله من تعلم الكثير من التكنولوجيات الحديثة وتكنولوجيات المستقبل وبدوري سأقوم بعرض عليكم هذا الكونسبت الذي يسمى الكلاود كومبيوتين وفي هذه الحصة بإذن الله سأتطرق على الكونسبت يعني من صفر يعني الآن ترون الأسم هو الكلاود 3.0 لكن في الحقيقة سأقوم بالتطرق من صفر إلى أن أصل إلى 3.0 المبادرة دارت جوجل للميناء يمكنكم الحصول على سيرتيفيكيت ويمكنكم أيضا الحصول على جوجل هوم ميني الروابط طبعا ستتحصلون عليها في الشات الآن سأقوم بعمل هذه السيشن بالإنجليزية أتمنى أن تكون اللغة مفهومة من الجميع إذا كانت لديكم أي أسئلة يمكنكم طرحها عليها لا مشكلة So Hello and welcome أزول في اللون Today we are going to see what is this concept called Cloud 3.0 and how Google did uh, reinvented this concept. So before we talk about the 3.0, we need to talk about the 1.0 uh, and the 2.0. So before we start, we need to define what is cloud computing, because I assume that many people don't understand the cloud computing or already heard about it, but not really as it should. So let's start. Cloud computing, if we take the Wikipedia definition, it's a computing on demand. Availability of a computer system resources, especially data storage, cloud storage, and computing power without direct active management by the user. We are going to explain this. This is something in English. Don't worry about it. We are going to give examples by image so you can understand I would say maybe 16 or 70 percent of those concepts. Okay. We have the main categories, which are IAS, which is infra. Uh, let me enable this. So we have the infrastructure as a service. I'm sorry about my pronunciation because English is my fourth language. So my third is French, my second is Arabic, my first is Kabyle. I'm Amazir, so. I try to do my best to make words pronounced as they should. Because in French we call this E, and in English it's I. So, infrastructure as a service, that means give me the machine, I will handle the rest. This is like you are renting a machine, and you are telling people, no, don't touch this, I will handle everything. Then you have the platform as a service. Imagine you don't want to break your head doing all those operating system stuff so you just need to program then you just have the platform as a service and then you have the third li layer which is the most uh, the, the one who, which is near the user which is the s for software right now i'm using google slides which is a software as a service i'm not coding i'm not doing an operating system stuff it's just a software and then we have a lot of letters that we will see that will change here. So, to understand this, just make things simpler and then let's talk how things worked in the past. We have a user. That user, he has a Google Chrome or an Android or an iPhone. Those are, uh, we call them in computer uh, word, user agents. He will use a modem. Let's call it a gateway. 
to make it outside his house or outside his mobile to connect to internet he will find another gateway this gateway he will make him enter to internet in internet there is a computer this computer is a web server a web server in this web server of course we have a ram we have a cpu and we have a storage and for security reason what we do is to split the server to two servers one we install the web server the second one we install the database server that's a classic that's what we call three tier uh, architecture and then we want to scale our application so that we don't have a single point failure for example if this uh, server shuts down we will have problems so what we do we bring a lot of servers to maximize the availability of our application and then we install some switches those switches to make the network stuff and then we replace our old hard disk with ssd to make it faster and this is what we call an on-premise cloud so in case you hear about on-premise cloud this is easier than this this is just a simple uh, concept which means that this cloud we can have it at home we can have it in the enterprise we don't need to go internet in reality that's why we call it in on-premise cloud so what we do right now we try to scale our on-premise because at a certain time we cannot handle the price of several servers we don't know if we use just one server and then traffic or the inverse we buy all this and then we will have small amount of traffic which means that we wasted money so what we do choose a public provider for, and let's talk about google google cloud or what we call gcp it just so a lot of machines like you see this is the exact on-premise cloud but somewhere else but this concept it's it's what uh, it is what you call it cloud just cloud and in the past now it's called cloud 1.0 why we call it cloud 1.0 because it's just a projection about what we have we try to make it in larger scale it's a simple architecture oh so, in reality we just projected what we have to some uh, somewhere else to maximize the available so if we try to replace all those machines we will have a compute engine which is the infrastructure as a service and then some people prefer to use the app engine which is the platform as a service we are still in cloud 1.0 and then all those switches we will replace it with a vpc which means a virtual private cloud we are not in our cloud we are in google's private cloud with their own machines with their own technologies and then we replace our uh, storage with cloud uh, storage which are cloud storage for the buckets and persistent disk if we want something about networking for people who wants uh, to do uh, to attach some disks on networking and then if we want to replace our database we just use one of this solution we have cloud memory store for cave values which is no sql we have cloud big table which runs google search and all the technology you see we have cloud data stores which is a document database for people who already used mongodb and then we have the cloud sql so what we do is that we bring our old mysql uh, mysql or postgres and then we will have a service which is exactly the same we will feel at home and then we will use cloud sql and then we will have the cloud spanner the cloud spanner it just the new technology made by Google and if you already uh, see the old uh, session 
I made about the, the future of database, this one, you know, in NoSQL, you have the problem called CAPE. Uh, you can't have availability and uh, partition tolerance at a large scale at the same time. Uh, highly available, uh, a strong consistent, uh, sorry. So with Cloud Spanner, you can assure those three points at the same time. You can have strong consistency, which means that if you comment right now, you will see the same commenter, and then the one who is living in Australia, you will see the same commenter uh, at the same time and without failure. This one, we will try to do a session just for this technology. So what I tried to do, what I tried to explain is how Cloud 1.0 works. So easier, it's just something that we already have. We try to mimic it on large scale. And then we bring the network side. The network side, we have cloud load balancing to do some load balancing to, for example, if you have a lot of people trying to connect, we try to split them in different places. We have the cloud router to configure the routes. We have the cloud armor, which plays what uh, for people coming from security, it's called the WAF. This is a web application firewall in case of someone tries to do SQL, uh, SQL injection or tries to attack your application, we can protect it using Cloud Armor. You have the Cloud Firewalls, which is just a firewall. And then you have the Cloud CDN to make caching your, uh, for example, if you, connect, uh, if you connect to a website and then you have jQuery, you don't have to host your jQuery in your website. You just bring it from a CDN, it's a cache. And you have the Cloud NAT, we will see it later. And then you have two types of uh, of networking. You have the premium network. You will use the Google's internal network, or you have the standard network. So in case you use the standard network, you will use the internet network. Because when you use Google's network, you will gain speed because they use a special technology that we will see later. And then you have the cloud uh, external IP to reserve an IP because by default, when you use uh, a virtual machine, her IP is ephemeral, which means that if you uh, shut it down and make it back, it will have another IP. So you need to reserve a static IP. And then you interact with all stuff with Cloud Shell and Cloud Console or programming it using Cloud SDK on your laptop. So Cloud Console and Cloud Shell is the interface you are going to use it on your browser. And Cloud SDK, it's in case you use Python, for example, to interact with all this. So this is the Cloud 1.0. And then at a certain time, you want to monitor all this using Stackdriver. So this architecture, all these technologies, they will help you to do what we call Cloud 1.0. So in cloud.1.0, uh, uh, the O, it's zero. So I just pronounce it O. So in cloud.1.0, uh, we just try to mimic what we already have. We try to take our cloud on-premise and then to make it online. Why we do this we can have more power and flexibility because we will pay just as you go, which means that we don't need to over utilize we don't need to under utilize for example if we bring three virtual machines on compute engine and then we want to scale up or scale down we don't have a problem but if we buy the hardware here we have a problem because if we buy the the, the hardware we will get a lot of issues because we are going to pay a lot of money Okay, so with time, what we got? We got big data, and then we got the AI boom. Now, every day you will hear about AI and big data. So what are those concepts? Let's explain them one by one. They are easy, don't worry. People, when they try to upload their pictures and then they try to uplo upload their videos on YouTube, 
What happened is that they got, I'm sorry. What happened is that they got lot of data uploaded. So you have to know one thing is investing in big data and AI is exactly investing in oil, petrol. Why? Because petrol is the same thing. What do you have? You have a lot of uh, resources underground and then people to transform those uh, resources to something that we can sell. And that's exactly what we do with big data, uh, da uh, big data and AI. We have a lot of data and we try to make something with that data to make decisions and to make, uh, for example, to decide how we are going to sell a product or how to improve it. So the problem with this data that some people upload pictures without categorizing them. For example, he will upload a cat picture and then he say, this is a car. So we need a system that tells, uh, 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 this is what we call the metadata. You have the data and you have the data of the data. This is called the metadata. So what we try to do at the end is to make the right metadata for our data. So in case of, uh, if I upload my picture, the system must say, this is me. This is not someone else. And then we got so much power because we are in the cloud. We are at Google. And at Google scale, we have a lot of machines and powerful machines. And then we got three kinds of jobs. We have the data analyst, people that use SQL. And then we have the data scientist, those people who use the machine learning. And then we have the data engineering, those people who use Hadoop and Spark, those three kind of uh, jobs that you will hear about them a lot. So what we do now, we try to take the GCP and we try to represent this new era. So what we do, we have a lot of data. We have pictures, we have videos, we have work, we have backups, we have social media. We try to use those products on GCP. So Google invented those products. We have the, the cloud data prep, which means that we are going to prepare our data. Why? Because we can have this kind of data, uncategorized data, or some people will upload missing fields. So what we do, we use data prep to prepare our data, or we use data flow because we need, sometimes we need some streaming, for example, videos, we need some streaming data and we need to analyze them in real time. And then we will have data proc. Data proc is to use with Spark. So for people coming for Spark, we will use data proc. And then BigQuery is the SQL for, uh, it's, uh, for people who already used Hadoop, you will use BigQuery as you are at home. Because BigQuery it will use SQL to make requests on your data and to make decisions on your data. We will see that later. And then we are in 2020 and it's the IoT emergence. So Google offered cloud IoT. And all that, we started seeing new AI startups. So for AI, if you have your own data, that's fine. You can use AutoML uh, product. If you want pre-trained models, that's fine. You have for pictures, for sound, for video, for text, what you want is here. And then if you want to program by your own, you can use AI platform, for example, using TensorFlow. So Google, what they, uh, they did, they offered the new technology because in the past, to make it faster, to make the AI faster, you can parallelize uh, because it's based on matrices. So if you have a matrix, you have uh, you can split the calculation. So if you want to split, you can parallelize it using the GPU. But Google invented the cloud TPU. This is a tensor processing unit, which means that if you inject to it some tensors or a lot of tensors, it will know how to make it faster. And this is for 
the AI. And then you have the BigQuery, which not only can do data processing, but it can also do AI. So you can do AI directly on BigQuery, which is really amazing. That's why if you use uh, the SDK or a Cloud Console or a Cloud Shell, BQ, uh, BigQuery has its own uh, command, which is BQ. OK, and when you are in the cloud, the problem is that you will have some permission. So if you are from Linux, you know this joke says that this is really not uh, uh, the ACL that you should affect to your files, because you make it public for everyone, and then you can't touch it. So you have the concept of access control. You are on the cloud. When, when you are in the cloud, knowing Linux uh, ACL is not enough. That's why Google made the cloud AM. Cloud AM, uh, I, uh, cloud IM simply, it just, you, uh, it's based on what we call airbag, role-based access control. So you give access control for people, for groups, for organization, uh, uh, and be careful. Uh, when you affect a role, it's it will propagate to the to the to the bottom, which means that if you affect for the group, all people in the group will have the same privilege. So be careful about this. We will do another session special on cloud IAM. Why I'm talking about all this? Because simply, we are talking about the clo cloud two dot Oh, cloud 2.0. And all of that, you see a lot of products. We need to monitor them too. So what we do? We do a debugger. If you want to, we want to make trace and profiling and error reporting and monitoring and logging. You can use those products or you can directly use stack driver. And stack drive, uh, driver, we'll see, uh, we'll see it also later. And all this made people think about microservices. You will hear a lot about microservices. As you can see, every time I talk about one product here, one product, one product, one product. Why? Because people right now, they try always to make things simpler. They make it modular. They don't make it uh, in one chunk. Sorry. OK. I'm sorry about this. So what is a microservice? Microservice is splitting your application on small modules. In the past, we called that system, uh, that architecture, a monolithic programming, which means that you take one file, you write your program, and then that's fine. But now we don't do that anymore. We take one file, we split it in several uh, functions. and why we do this because we need what we call a container we will see a container in a few seconds and those containers need to communicate between uh, uh between each other using the api the api which means the application programming interface and they communicate between each other using json or rest and this is useful for scalability. Why? Imagine that you have a social media uh, application, and then you program everything in one file, and then you want to scale. What you can do is just scale the main file, and this is not good. Why? Because in the main file, you have two functions. For example, let's make it easier. We have the login, and then we have the picture processing. If you scale the lonely file, the problem is that you reserve too much resources only for login, and you reserve the same processing power for picture processing, which is not uh, the same. Because in login, the processing uh, power you need, it's not as big as picture processing. In picture processing, you need a lot of resources. So what you do, you split your program in two chunks. The first one, it's login. You give it uh, a small power resources. And the second one, you reserve a big machine for this one. And that's why 
the emergence of microservice enters in the cloud.2.0. Uh, and then we have some constraints because we cannot switch to an old word to a new word without having problems. From one, so what do we do we have? We have how we are going to handle those containers. Easy, Google made Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an orchestrator, which means that if one of the containers fails, he will know that. So he will spawn another uh, container. And not only they made it, but they donated it for the CNCF, which means the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. That's why now you will hear about Kubernetes at Red Hat, at Microsoft, at, uh, uh, at Amazon. Why? Because it's open source. So everyone can, can, can contribu uh, contribute it, uh, on it. Sorry. So Google made Kubernetes and donated it, and now everyone is using it. And then we will have another problem. Since we are making communication between two services or more, we will have a problem about latency. Don't worry, VPC is global. VPC, as we saw earlier, is for virtual private. The Google Viter, uh, virtual uh, private cloud is global. It's not by region. Some providers will tell you, we will give you only regional, but Google is global. It's made on top of Jupyter and Andromeda, which are software uh, networks. They made a special technology to make it special and faster. And as you can see in, uh, in 19, they made it at 32 uh, gigabit, uh, gigabit per second, which is really big. Even at home, you cannot have this. Uh, with the routers and the switch, I think the switch is uh, 10 at max. So this is on cloud. And as you can see, you can have this. So you will not have the problem about latency. How about security? Security, you can manage uh, your cloud AM. And then Google, they make another solution, which called Gvisor. Gvisor, what is Gvisor? When you host your containers, people will tell you they are not fully uh, sandboxed, which means that uh, someone who can attack one container, he will go to another container because they are hosted on the same machine. So what did Google? They invented Gvisor, which is open source too. And then you have your data, which is encrypted everywhere. And then how those uh, services communicate with each other? Simply using two main technologies that Google invented too. You have the gRPC and protobuf. RPC, the G for Google, RPC for remote procedure, uh, procedure call, procedure or a function, even if it's not the same, but let's consider it a function, which means that you will execute a function at a remote, at another machine. And protobuf, which means protocol buffer, it's a way how to serialize your data serializing data uh, imagine it it's like putting it in the box and send it to someone the good thing with protobuf is fully compressed which means that all your uh, network will be fully optimized and then you have the devops everyone hears about devops developer operation simply google gave the new concept co called the Google Seat Reliability Engineer, SRE, which, which is a, uh, a set of rules that teaches you how you are going to deal with failure, how you are going to deal with your reports, with your monitoring, and so on. And if you want to use a service made by Google, you can use the APG, the APG, which, which is uh, a service that can handle your APIs. OK. In the past, people, you know this joke. When it doesn't work, he will tell you, no, it worked on my machine. Now he will tell you, no, it worked on my container. So just, just a joke. Okay, let's represent what we did on GCP. So what we do, we upload our Docker, our container, and then we have a container registry. This is like 
uh, imagine this is like a Google Play for application. And then you have an orchestrator to manage the containers. Once we do that, we can have what is called now the CI and CD. For people who claim in being DevOps, this is for you. CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous development. So what we do? We go to Cloud uh, Source Repository, which is equivalent for uh, uh, GitHub. We put our code source here, source code here. And then we have Cloud Build. He will build uh, the source at a certain time. And then we manage all this using Jenkins. So this makes the Cloud 2.0. If you are a programmer, earlier we saw the data processing, now we saw how to handle programs. So what if we want to have two things, two beautiful things at the same product? Here comes the multi-cloud and the hybrid cloud. Why? Because some people will tell you, no, I want to use Google Cloud, but I want to make some services in my machine. For example, our data must stay here and then we will send it encrypted and then use some uh, some power without uh, being decrypted here. So what we do, we use what we, what we call a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud. For example, you saw something at Amazon that you like, but you like something else in Google Cloud, that's fine. You can have the both uh, cloud provider at the same application. So what we do, we use cloud router or cloud VPN. Okay, so what's it? We configure a VPN. Every no, everybody knows VPN because everyone uses it with games and uh, Netflix and so on. So we, uh, we use cloud VPN and then we configure cloud router. Why we use cloud router? To have a dynamic routing, which we, uh, we called it the protocol BGP for people coming from networking. So why? So we will connect our on-premise to Google Cloud using a VPN. But we have an issue is that one, uh, when we have bigger data, bigger traffic, we cannot do that. So what we do, we can opt for this solution, partner interconnect and dedicated interconnect. You just check about that for the full list of partners that you can use. And this is Cloud 2.0. So. To summarize the cloud 2.0, we have the big data, the AI, containers, DevOps, and the role-based access control. And then we have the multi and the hybrid cloud. You see, even cloud, it was split. And now we will see our main subject, which is cloud 3.0. Henry Ford said one day, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. The meaning of, uh, of what he said is that people always try to improve what they have. They don't try to bring something new because they fear it. So how we switch it from on-premise to cloud 1.0 and then to cloud 2.0, we will see what's going on in cloud 3.0. And let's dream bigger. What if our application can scale without hassle? We don't have to configure anything. And what if we make cloud native? I don't think, uh, I, uh, uh, for people who program on mobile, you remember about those tricks about using the web view, using Cordova, where you program on uh, an application on both uh, iPhones and Android, but it was heavy. Why? Because it was using uh, web view, so it was just an HTML. But now we have uh, we have an other solutions, for example, uh, for mobile developers. Uh, for example, we'll be back later. Okay, sorry, I'm a little bit uh, fuzzy. So, what if we want to invent a new way instead of using old paradigms. We saw earlier that we were programming using uh, a monolithic application, and then we switched it to uh, microservices. What if we invent another 
paradigm. And what if it was easier for my on-premise to scale easier, which means that instead of using VPN and interconnect and so on, I can go and connect my on-premise to a public cloud. And this is, we start with serverless. You always hear about serverless in 2020. What is serverless? Serverless is a new way of programming where no servers to manage or provision. You don't see server. Imagine it as like software as a service. The conception, not capacity priced, which means that you will pay for what you consume, not for the capacity of the application. And then it scales with usage. You don't tell her, uh, tell your application to scale. It scales automatically. And availability and fault tolerance built in because you are programming at a large scale. So one node will not affect other nodes. Let's see as an example. On Google, you have the cloud functions and cloud runs. Those products are serverless if you want to program. And then if you want to do data processing, you have BigQuery, you have cloud data flow, and then you have cloud data prep. So they are serverless. You don't see the machine. You just program, and it is scaled by its own. And then you have the new paradigm you will see a lot in future, which is the PubSub. The PubSub, it's a concept based on a publisher subscriber. So you have a topic, and then in this topic, there are publisher who submit their message. A message is just, so imagine it, uh, it's, uh, it contains variables. So you send them to the topic, and there is a subscriber that retrieves them. And it is at a large scale. You don't worry about programming. You don't worry about scalability. Everything is handled by PubSub. And then you control everything using Cloud IAM because you don't touch the programming interface, which means that you need some kind of restriction about access. You program this. Uh, you, 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 you handle this using Cloud IAM. So let's see an example. You uploaded the picture. We will write a cloud function. In this cloud function, you have to know one thing. Forget Java when you work with cloud function. Why? Because you have what is called the cold start. So the cold start is the time that may it take your program to start. So in Java, you have the GVM, which takes a lot of time. That's why you will hear a lot about JavaScript and Python. They don't need a lot of time to start. So you write your function using Python or JavaScript. This picture, you will put it on cloud storage, on a bucket. So what happens, there will be a function that will be fired because function as a service works on uh, events, which means there is an event that you uploaded the picture, the function will fire, and then you start paying for your application. And then you need to know what this picture contains. So you will use Cloud Vision API. You just write another function to detect, uh, to, uh, to send the content to the vision. And then you use the Cloud uh, PubSub to manage all that uh, if you have a lot of pictures and a lot of uh, consumers. So if we see this, we can consider the storage as a publisher and Cloud Vision as a consumer. You don't need a human to consider it as a publisher or a subscriber. OK. And then you manage this, of course, using Cloud IAM. How about security? There is Cloud IAM and the same uh, constraints we saw earlier with Cloud.0. Encryption is everywhere. But there is a problem, is that there was no standard for function as a service. That's why Google, they made Knative. Knative, they made it open source. Why? Because in the past, for example, people were made uh, were making operating system, but there was no standard. That's why they invented what we call the POSIX. And the POSIX for the Cloud 3.0, it will be the Knative. And in Knative, you can use function directly on Kubernetes. And that's why you have the product Cloud Run works on Knative. You will see a lot about Knative. 
And what if we want to make our uh, hybrid cloud easier? Let's see an example. We have the Aussie. We have seven layers. This is the networking. It's split on seven layers. Right now, we are using this layer because we are in HTTPS. And then this is the architecture of uh, Kubernetes. You have a cluster. You have a node. Inside the node, you have a pod. Inside the pod, you have a container. So what we do? What if we want to use this layer? Because in VPN or in Cloud Interconnect and so on, we were using those two layers, layer two or layer three. So what if we, we use the layer seven? to gain a lot of uh, advantages. Let's see this. We just use what we call a service mesh. A service mesh, Istio, you will hear about it a lot. So how it will work, you have your pod, you just install a proxy right here. Why? Because we said that uh, Kubernetes can handle if this fails it will spawn another one, but he doesn't know what's going on inside the pod, uh, inside the container. So Istio, what is uh, made for, it's made for services. Services, it's the application itself. So the service mesh, Istio will handle this. It will handle if it fails and it will make it easier to make your own hybrid cloud. So your on-premise and the cloud you will uh, you will have on GCP, they will communicate using service mesh on layer seven. Okay. Problem is that when you are in the enterprise, you don't have only programmers. Also, uh, managers and businessmen and people who don't care about programming. So how you are going to do this? Just use Cloud AM because in Cloud AM. You will have teams, and those teams you will split them, and then you will give them a role-based uh, access control, which means that, for example, a programmer can access to this service, but a manager doesn't have to access to that. So you just handle this with Cloud IAM, and we will come at the end of the resume of what is Cloud 3.0. We will have the hybrid Cloud 2.0. We will have the compute anywhere at massive scale. We'll use service mesh, and the application becomes functions, not virtual machines. And that's what we call serverless. We will have the function as a service and backend and service. I'm sorry I didn't talk a lot about backend service. Backend as a service, you have Firebase. I focused a lot about GCP. Firebase, if you want to do a mobile application, for example, uh, backend as a service is here. It will handle your backend. And then airbag security, it will become a role-based access security and not a programming way, CH mode and CH own and so on. And the DevOps and SRE, they gave access to everyone because the main goal of DevOps is to minimize the time to market of your application because your application, you need to see it as a product not as a programming uh, thing, because you need to sell something. And if you want to sell something, the time is important. So using the DevOps and SRE, the SRE, you can have the book for free. It's made by Google. You can have all this, and you will have the Cloud 3.0. So we saw how to make a simple application from simple uh, three-tier service, uh, three-tier architecture. We scale it on uh, on-premise, and then we saw what is cloud 1.0, cloud 2.0, and then cloud 3.0. I'm sorry for my English. It's not that good. And uh, if you have any questions, let me see about YouTube. If you have any questions, I'm 
I'm checking the comments. So if you have a question, I'm here. I hope it was clear. So, thank you very much, and sorry again for my bad language. <laughs> I will try to improve it next time. Okay, thank you very much, and see you in next sessions.